Hello, uh, this is Haining. Welcome to our presentation by me, together with uh, my colleagues, uh, Tian Yi Mao and Bo Li, like uh, regarding our recent progress in dissecting the mechanism underlying emotional learning associated with a brain structure called the amygdala. Our learning experience is often heavily associated with our emotions, such as fear and reward. This is well exemplified by the saying that once beaten, twice shy. And you can bet that this guy after an electric shot, fear will make him have a hard time put his hand on another similar orange power cable. And this is a good in many ways. They, uh, it helps us to navigate away from potential dangers. Uh, but at the same time, like too much of it can also be problematic. For example, in the case of post traumatic uh, stress uh, uh, stress disorder, the extreme the extreme emotional uh, uh, sorry, the, the extreme emotional charge the war theme uh, often may uh, many soldiers had a hard time to come back to their normal daily life. At a later time. So this uh, fear learning, whether it's good or bad, uh, uh, it's largely mediated by an, an almond-shaped structure called the amygdala that is uh, deep in the brain. And if we lose the function of the amygdala, such as in this patient, SM, she had lesions in both the side of her amygdala, and even under the most fearful conditions where most people tremble, she would feel comfortable and laugh. And additional research has established that the amygdala function is associated with um, <clears throat> depression, aggression, anxiety, fear, uh, PTSD, bipolar disorders, with a whole variety of neuropsychiatric disease. Uh, in addition to, uh, to fear, the amygdala is also important for other types of emotions, such as uh, uh, seeking a reward. And you can bet that in terms of reward seeking, in the extreme case, it's addiction. So the amygdala is also associated with addictions. What, uh, what I have told you so far is that the amygdala is important for a large number of um, uh, neuropsychiatric disease uh, uh, and also is important for our normal functions. However, knowing that the amygdala is important is one thing, knowing how it works is different and we really need to know how the amygdala work in order to be able to provide treatments to some of the psychiatric diseases. This is very similar to the case there, like in a computer, most people know that the CPU is a super important for the computer's function, but at the same time, knowing how the CPU work is a different story. And that's where our research team uh, try to do uh, for the amygdala. Uh, to study the function of amygdala, we use a uh, 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 mouse, as our model system, the function of amygdala is uh, highly conserved uh, between a mouse and human, uh, in, including the structure as well. And, uh, and the advantage of using mouse, of course, is that this gives us a large number of experimental animals. Allow, it's much easier to amendable to experimental designs, and so allow us to do careful control experiments. And there has also been a large body of literature already study how the amygdala functions in mouse. This allow us to stand on the shoulder of giants. And in particular for our research team, we try to understand the amygdala, how it functions at the low level of neuronal circuits, as illustrated by this schematic. Here, the amygdala is represented by a group of blue neurons that are at the middle layer. And this, in fact, is a very underrepresent of the amygdala. The amygdala has probably hundreds of thousands of neurons. And each neuron potential has uh, received inputs from upstream brain regions, and it also uh, send their projection to the downstream output regions. And from all these output centers, they potentially like, uh, can link to uh, influence the different um, animal behaviors, such as uh, animal defense versus reward seeking. If without any prior knowledge, then one have to assume that any of the input brain region has certain probability to connect to every one of these neurons who are the, from the amygdala neurons to the output centers. So this can give us a very complex uh, diagram, which uh, is not exactly easy to study. 
by the same time, if you think about it, probably not all the uh, all the potential brain regions that can send a projection would connect to the amygdala, and uh, and also probably amygdala does not output to every single output centers. Um, so uh, if one can gain such information, the diagram become a lot simplified. And in addition, based on our current knowledge of amygdala and also how the brain is organized in other uh, part of the brain, the amygdala is likely consists of many functional uh, subregions. And then also in each functional subregion, like uh, the neurons uh, come in different subtypes as represented by the different colors. Uh, here, uh, and uh, what a common theme like uh, in neuronal circuit is that like uh, one particular input brain region does not connect to all the functional domains. Uh, in fact, like uh, it, it may connect only to one or a few of the functional domain, and then in some other input regions may only connect to one or a few subtype of the neurons. So, uh, and similar things can also be said from amygdala to its output centers. If one can gain such information, the wiring diagram can really greatly be simplified. It's still fairly complex, but it's a lot more manageable compared to when we start. So uh, for our project, like the, our first goal is to understand the anatomy and using this uh, to understand the way the input and output wiring diagram of the amygdala and this uh, allow us to constrain the possibilities and easily uh, easier understand exactly what the amygdala is doing. Then uh, at the second level, we want to know like uh, how the amygdala works uh, kind of uh, during the animal behavior. Uh, the amygdala neurons has uh, uh, like, uh, they will fire the uh, electrical activities called action potentials and seeing like uh, which neurons are firing action potential and for how long, how strong. This will give us crucial information in dissecting out how amygdala carry out its computations. And in addition, uh, so like uh, knowing the anatomy and also seeing this electrical activity is not enough. So um, amygdala is the emotional center, so it receives a lot of inf emotional information, uh, and uh, and this is integrated into the computation. Uh, and power. Of <clears throat> so. Um, So, uh, the, uh, so like uh, they, they, this uh, integrate like uh, into the uh, information and the uh, and the emotional. Uh, the emotional usually come in a variety uh, a wide a way of neural communication called neural modulation. Um, neural modulation, unlike the typical electric connections, uh, they are uh, uh, they are mediated by neural modulators that such as dopamine in the case of reward or norepinephrine in the case of stress. Like uh, they are, uh, uh, they communicate in a way uh, that is uh, volumetric. Uh, in that, like uh, they keep, uh, uh, they um, their concern globally increase in the amygdala, and they can simultaneously interact with uh, uh, thousands of neurons. And depend on what type of neuron, uh, like uh, uh, is there, and what type of receptor they are, like uh, the the same new modulator can greatly enhance the function of uh, certain pathways. And at the same time, can uh, can greatly decrease the function of other pathways. This is more analogous to this is more analogous to um, the DJ uh, control panels, uh, like in a, a music concert hall that control the very complex electric circuits there. So, uh, in order to understand amygdala function, we also need to be able to look at new modulations. So these are all uh, these are all demanding um, these are all demanding uh, uh, like a, um, tasks uh, and require a lot of expertise. So therefore, like uh, for our project, we bring in uh, three uh, different labs. Like uh, and here, like uh, I'm more of a technologist here. Uh, that uh, that we are developing microscopy technique allow one to see neural modulations, uh, and my colleague uh, Tanya Mouse Lab, she is um, a modern quantitative anatomist. Uh, allow her to uh, so uh, so that she will 
uh, look uh, examine the the neural connectivities like uh, and that allow us to constrain the possibilities and eventually uh, boldly our biologists here will um, uh, our biology here will uh, basically integrate the tools that we develop and also the informa anatomy information and try to eventually dissect out exactly what is going on in the amygdala. So uh, for the remaining part of the presentation, uh, it will separate into three parts with each part presented by a researcher for their own progress. And for the first part, I will show you some of our recent advances in terms of understanding neural modulation. Uh, so seeing new modulation in deep brain structures. This is a powerful ongoing long-term collaboration with the uh, tennis lab and the picture here, Lei, Ba, and Wei Hong are three re very talented research associates who carry out most of the experiments uh, with help from our collaborator, Bo, and also other collaborators such as uh, Jin Ding at Stanford. And we are very grateful for NIH and the Brain Initiative funding. So, Seeing neural modulation is not exactly easy. Uh, even the same neural modulators, like uh, they can, uh, they can depend on the cell type or depend on the receptor type, they can have very different effects on the neuronal functions. But a few years back, what we noticed that like uh, uh, there's a different neural modulation pathway. They all converge onto one subcellular signaling pathway called the cyclamp PK pathway, and depending on the modality the neural modulation pathway may either activate or inhibit this pathway. And we reason that if we can monitor the activity of this uh, CYCAMP and PK pathway, we actually use it as one way of read out to examine what type of uh, neural modulation events that's uh, happening uh, in individual neurons. So this pathway by itself uh, is not easily visible. So uh, we have to put in a probe in our case, a genetic encoded sensor called a kinase activity reporter into the cells. A genetic encoded sensor means that like, uh, it can be assembled together as a piece of DNA, and then we can have a variety of ways to put this DNA into the cell, and then the cell uses its own transcription and translation machinery can make the DNA into a protein. And in this protein, it has uh, multiple functional domains, but on at the two end, there is a green fluorescent protein, GAP, and also an uh, red fluorescent protein, IP. When the activity or signal pathway is low, the sensor adopts a loose configuration and the distance between GAP and RP uh, are long, and there's very little interaction between GAP and RP. So uh, if you excite the GAP fluorescence, you uh, mostly get the normal GAP fluorescence. And when the activity of the pathway increase, uh, the the PK, which is also called the cyclamp dependent kinase, can transfer a phosphate group to the sensor. This put the sensor in a closed configuration. And now the distance between GAP and RP is closed, and there is a, this a phenomenon called force resonance energy transfer or FRED happen. What FRED does is that it will transfer part of the GAP energy when GAP is excited to the RP. What it uh, effectively does is that it decreases the GAP fluorescence and increases the corresponding RP fluorescence. And if one can measure FRED, one can um, measure the sensor, the activity of the, uh, the signaling pathways. Uh, the sensor has been uh, developed for over 15 years, and it has been successfully applied uh, uh, in in vitro experiments such as the cell culture. However, what we want to do, uh, what we want to do is we apply this sensor in vivo, which uh, is much more challenging, and pure has not been. Uh, successful over the past 15 years. And uh, eventually, like uh, with a lot of try and error, like we use a three plunge approach uh, like uh, uh, that allow us to achieve our goal. And the first one is that like we use uh, a different microscopy than most people do. We use uh, a technique called two-photon fluorescent lifetime imaging microscopy or 2 p flip. Most people would measure for using a technique called ratiometric imaging, which in which people measure the GAP fluorescence and RP fluorescence and do a ratio of the two. The two of lifetime imaging has a lot of advantage compared to the more conventional ratiometric imaging in that it's uh, much more quantitative, it's stable, and it's, uh, 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 and it's relatively insensitive to change in the environments, which is inevitable in the in vivo imaging 
conditions. I'm not going into the mechanism of the lifetime imaging, but if the uh, uh, the audience want to know more, please check out this link here. And uh, in another aspect, uh, many different labs has developed many variants of the ACAR sensor. And what we did is uh, we shop around and we compare all the different sensors. As I'm going to show you like uh, in the next slides, not all of these sensors are the same. And, uh, and uh, our shop around allow us to identify the best sensor. And from there, we further improve the best sensor. Here, we sh I will show you some of the examples. And in this first example, we compare our microscopy, the lifetime imaging, with the more conventional ratiometric imaging. As the ratiometric imaging is showing right here, as you can see, once uh, we go into a brain tissue, its value continue to change. Uh, and this may be very hard to compare one cell from another and uh, one day from another. Just mu much harder to interpret the results. At the same time, the lifetime imaging measurements shown in blue here is stable at different uh, brain tissue depths. And when we shop around, this shows our result of shopping around one of the sensor, the purple one, really outperforms all the other sensors. And this is very important. So that this allow, tells us that which sensor to use. And from there, like we further improve the sensor, showing green. We have now have a sensor called TAKR alpha. Uh, it's very for respond to endogenous new modulators such as uh, no adrenaline. Uh, its uh, activity, uh, uh, its uh, response uh, becomes almost three times as big as the original purple sensors. So with these improvements, like this allow us to take the sensor in vivo successfully and we can now routinely like a look at the PK activity and use it as a readout for new modulation, for example, in the mouse cortex. And it, in this example, in the mouse cortex that has been published, we can open a window in the mouse uh, skull. This allows us to look at the neurons in the mouse cortex, and we can measure PK activity there. And in this example, we look at the effect of several prescription drugs that is uh, prescribed to human, uh, and they are known to affect uh, PK pathways. And sure enough that these drugs, they all alter the PK activity in mouse cortical neurons. Uh, they either increase its activity or decrease activity that is consistent with the mechanism, how they work. Seeing PK activity in the cortex is one thing, but, at, um, but the amygdala is uh, deep in the brain. So like uh, in order to see PK activity deep in the brain, like uh, there's additional challenges. And we need to somehow be able to see the signal deep in brain. And in order to do this, we use a, a we use a green lens, which is very similar to a needle. Uh, this shows a real life example of a green lens in compared to a penny. As you can see, the green lens is very like a needle. This allows us to poke it relatively deep into the mouse brain uh, with relatively small damage. And uh, in our experiments, after we implement the green lens, the mouse still happily live afterwards and it can successfully perform all the behavior tasks we ask the mouse to perform. At the same time, this needle is also a lens. This allows us to gain optical access deep into the brain. And in a testing case, we apply this technology to another deep brain structure called the striatum, which is uh, important for animal locomotion. And in order to assay its function, we let the mouse either rest or run on a treadmill. Uh, we can measure its speed. We can also control the speed of the treadmill if necessary. And in this last data slide, uh, we have the mouse run, uh, force the mouse to run, and you can see, see that whenever the mouse run, there is a big spike of PK activity. And this is really the first time people have the ability to read out these kind of activities. Uh, and, and we are very excited about this result, and we are actively analyzing this result. And looking forward in the context of our current project, we are also very excited about that like we will take the deep brain PK activity imaging as a readout for neural modulation and in collaboration with uh, Tian Yi and Bo Li, try to uh, use it to read out the neural modulation activity in the context of uh, emotional learning in the amygdala. Uh, thank you. And with this, like uh, I will turn over to my colleague uh, Tian Yi for her part of the presentation. Hi, my name is Tiani Mao. I'm a social professor at the Volum Institute at Oregon Health and Science University. 
The data I'm going to present to you today was mainly carried out by a talented postdoc, Mike Muniat, in my lab, in close collaboration with Zhu Hao and Meng Sinai, with the help from technician Mao Zhenqing and my great collaborators, Hai Ning Zhong and Bo Li, in this team. My goal in this collaborative project is to establish a comprehensive and quantitative connectivity map for the amygdala and to identify the structural features that may guide functional studies at the cellular level, as you just heard from Hainin's presentation. At the behavioral level, you will hear from Bo Li. So we can make this analogy as the reverse engineering of a computer chip. Both of this are input-output apparatus. And both of these are connected, interconnected in very specific ways that information can flow in very defined directions. And finally, um, the neighboring parts are not necessarily connected, so we will have to be able to track the wires and find all their downstream target that might be far away. We want to figure out who is talking to who in what manner, and this needs to be quantitatively and systematically. In order to do that, our experimental approach needs to satisfy at least the following criteria. For today's presentation, I will be focusing on mapping the amygdala outputs. First, we will have to uh, use the tracers that allow us to precisely label amygdala neurons cell body locally. And this tracer have to be able to transport to the neuronal process, including the neuronal axons that travel far away. In case of human, this can be over a meter. We need to be able to image all the potential targets of the amygdala, which are known to spread widely, and we need high sensitivity so we can identify single axons and think and find axonal processes. Because we have to apply those tracers locally, otherwise we'll be losing a tracing resolution. We can only put each tracer in one location per brain. And we will need to sig increase a significant number of animals to cover the entire amygdala. Therefore, we will need to develop methods that allow us to compare across animals. And finally, um, we will need to assemble the quantitative input and output map, and that uh, requires us to develop computational algorithms. To meet all these criteria, our team harvests on the most recent technology development in neuroscience, engineering, and computation. First, we choose the tracing methods uh, uh, viral media fluorescence expression for fluorescence proteins. In this case, we inject an adeno-associated virus, AAV, into a brain region, as you can see those bright spots on this slide. And the fluorescence protein, in this case, green fluorescence protein, GFP, will be expressed and filled up the uh, neuronal process. You can trace some of this process, go across corpus callosum and go to the other side of the brain. You can also see a few targets that be labeled by green, green fluorescence protein that's far away from the soma. Now, using these methods, we inject a similar virus into the amygdala, and shown on here as two bright spots, and the brain is viewed from the top with the nose pointing to your left. You can see that, indeed, axonal of the amygdala projections are widely spread. Um, also, some of the projections goes to the midbrain, and uh, uh, this suggests this confirms the necessity of using whole brain mapping technology. As I mentioned to you earlier, to ensure the tracing resolution, we use one trace, tracer per brain. So, in order to increase the data collection and data and analysis efficiency, um, here we're using two different colors by injecting two virus expressing green and red fluorescence protein, respectively, GFP and TD tomato in this case. You can see that with some small displacement, the green and red injections that are uh, into the amygdala have shared and distinct targets. This data will allow us to analyze topographic relationship between injections and their projection target, as well as I mentioned, increase the data collection and data analysis efficiency. 
you probably can also notice some of the process of those axons that you need, indeed very thin and uh, fine. So to ensure that we can detect those axons at all targets of the amygdala, we um, use antibody staining to amplify the signal. In this case, we use antibody against GFP proteins and TD tomato proteins, respectively. One example showing the bottom left is the image that before antibody staining and on the right is after staining, suggesting that antibody staining is necessary for us to detect axons at the uh, projection target. Now, with this high resolution and high sensitivity imaging, we end up pretty typical one terabytes of data per brain. So data visualization and data analysis are still challenging with data size as such. On the next slide, I will show you example where we put together the uh, original images using the imaging sequence. We collect the data, but here we uh, displayed it using vertical section to allow us to look at the different uh, reference points. So please play the video. Going forward with several of these 100 injections in hand, as I mentioned earlier, we aim to construct a comprehensive input-output map for the amygdala. This is built upon our previous tremendous experience constructing other brain circuits in similar scale. Hopefully, we will develop novel algorithms that specific analyzing amygdala's property. Just give a few examples of how we have done this previously. For example, we can look at the relationship of many injections. As shown example here, as one injection, if we project to the target, we label this injection as a positive injection. If it's been surrounded by many other injections that do not project to one of our targets, we can actually construct uh, the injection origin by subtracting the negative injections. Also, another example is that we were able to construct information that come from different sources and project to the comprehensive target as labeled here as information source and to the information target. This analysis allow us to understand in the comprehensive way whether the potential subregions of the amygdala projecting to all their targets. Furthermore, using our um, methods, we have previously shown that we can use input and output to define the brain subregions that are functionally relevant. For example, at the top is the subregions of the brain structure called thalamus, which we constructed by using their projection target. In the middle is the stratum subregions we reconstructed using the input to this brain region. Many of these subdomains are now being shown by many other labs in the field to be important for the function and uh, readout of these circuits. We're hoping that using this data set, we can do the same for amygdala, which is allow us to have the comprehensive input and output map, and importantly, to label subregions of amygdala that's are functionally relevant, and we can pass the information to Bolis lab to test them in the behavior. Hi, this is Boli. I'm a professor in neuroscience in Kuzman Harbor Lab. I'm going to be focusing on the third part of this collaborative uh, project. Uh, that is to determine how cellular events within discrete amygdala circuits contribute to behavior. So first of all, I would like to thank the people who are working on this project, including people in my lab at the Kuzman Harbor Lab. Uh, this includes three uh, talented individuals, Tao Yang, uh, Kai Yu, and Red Hashri Shama. I would also like to thank my collaborators, Han Ning Zheng and Tian Yi Mao uh, at the Oregon Health and Science University. This work is supported by uh, the grant from NIH Brain Initiative. 
So here we're going to focus on uh, two different type of behaviors. One type of behavior is defensive behavior uh, that is driven by uh, aversive stimuli. And a second type of behavior is called the reward-seeking behavior, which is driven by uh, rewarding uh, stimuli. So we're going to uh, look at activities of neurons in the amygdala in mice uh, performing these two very different kind of behavior. So in the amygdala, we're going to image uh, the calcium activities of individual neurons, uh, which is a proxy of the firing of action potentials in these neurons. In addition, we are also going to image uh, neuromodulation activity in these neurons. So this neuromodulatory activity may represent uh, the emotional aspects of different stimuli, including uh, both the aversive stimuli as well as uh, the rewarding stimuli. So here is a diagram of the amygdala. So we're going to focus on the central part of the amygdala called the central amygdala. So this part of the amygdala has been shown by many studies in the past, including the study in our lab uh, that control uh, both defensive behavior and also the reward-seeking behavior. So neurons in the central amygdala can be identified based on a specific genetic marker that they express. For example, one kind of neuron shown in red here uh, express a specific genetic marker called PKC delta. And there is a different type of neuron shown in blue here uh, express a different kind of genetic marker called somatostatin or, or SOL. So the PKC delta neuron and the somatostatin neuron in the central amygdala are embedded in uh, different input output circuits. A uh, prior study indicated that these two kind of neurons may play different roles in defensive versus reward-seeking behavior. But how exactly these neurons participate or contribute to such behaviors is still unclear. So how are we going to study uh, the function of these neurons? So we're going to use mice, as uh, introduced to you already by my uh, collaborator, Han Yan Zhong and Tian Yi Mao, uh, because uh, we have genetic tools to allow us to target uh, specific neurons in the amygdala based on the genetic markers. So for example, uh, we can uh, use virus uh, using a different promoter to target either PKC data neuron or a study neuron in the central amygdala. And this allows us to introduce uh, activity indicators into this neuron. And then we will uh, implant a grain length uh, on top of this neuron. And through this grain length, we are able to image the activity of the, uh, the infected neurons using either uh, one photon or two photon microscopy. So the animals will be trained in specific uh, behavior tasks. For example, we can train the animal to learn uh, to associate uh, one sound uh, with a aversive stimulus, such as a tail shock. And also train the same animal to associate with a different sound, uh, to, uh, to associate a different sound with a rewarding stimulus, such as uh, a water reward. These animals are water deprived, so they are very thirsty. So water is very rewarding to them. So this uh, behavior paradigm, together with the imaging method will allow us to uh, look at the response properties of different type of neurons to different stimuli, including different sounds, uh, the tail shock, uh, and also the water reward. For example, we have uh, imaged the activity of PKC data neurons in the central amygdala uh, in response to tail shock. So in this case, we use a virus to deliver uh, a GCOM6, which is a calcium indicator into the PKC data neurons in the central amygdala. And then we uh, deliver shock to the tail of the animal. So on the right side, you can see uh, in the field of view, there are many neurons uh, that have been uh, uh, imaged. Uh, you can see in the bottom, uh, on the right side, uh, four individual neurons showing responses to uh, uh, the, shock, uh, the shock delivery to the tail. So roughly about 50% uh, of the neurons show strong responses to, uh, to the shock. So currently, we are also cut across 
uh, the response properties of this neuron to reward different frequency of sound or to a different uh, punishment or uh, aversive stimuli, such as uh, air, air pop blew into the face. So in addition, uh, currently we are also using uh, 2P, uh, two photon flame imaging to image PKA activity in these neurons. Uh, essentially, the met methodology is the same as what Han Yun Zheng already uh, described in the first part of this talk. The only difference is that here we're going to image the PKA activity uh, in the central amygdala instead of in the striatum. And in the animal uh, that learned to uh, use sound to predict either the tail shock or a reward, to get the water reward. So eventually, we were hoping to be able to image uh, both PKA activity and calcium activity in the same neuron uh, in the animal that perform uh, either the aversive learning or uh, the reward learning um, paradigm. So besides imaging the activities of the neurons, we we'll also uh, plan to determine the rule of uh, different type of neuron in the central amygdala in uh, the ability to perform this behavior. So in this case, uh, we need to be able to control the activity of uh, different neurons in the central amygdala. Uh, for example, we can use a method called optogenetics to uh, inhibit uh, the neurons of interest. Uh, in this case, we need to deliver a molecule that is sensitive to light uh, to uh, the neurons of the interest. And then when we shine light onto this neuron, we will activate this, activate this uh, inhibitor and therefore to silence uh, the neuron. So for example, we, ha we have used this method to inhibit uh, PKC data neuron uh, during fear conditioning. And that's, that allows us to observe that this leads to the impairment of uh, fair memory uh, formation. So this kind of uh, manipulation allows us to uh, establish a causal relationship between a type of neuron and a specific type of behavior. So uh, going forward, uh, our collaborative project will allow us to determine how exactly the PKC data neurons contribute to fear learning uh, including fear conditioning. Uh, in particular, it will allow us to, uh, for the first time, to describe how PKA activities uh, in this neuron is involved in such kind of learning. In addition, we will be able to determine uh, also uh, the rule of PKC data activity, PKC data neuron activity in reward learning. Uh, and furthermore, to determine other kind of neurons, such as semantic study neuron in reward learning and also aversive learning. So in parallel, as you already heard from my collaborator Tian Yi Mao's talk, uh, we uh, will be able to provide a detailed and a precise wiring diagram of uh, amygdala neurons uh, in terms of their connectivity with different input and output regions. So this uh, precise uh, wiring diagram will guide us to study uh, the precise function of uh, uh, distinct neuronal populations within uh, a particular input output circuit and to ask the question of how they precisely participate in reward learning or punishment learning. So with that, I just want to uh, give a quick summary of our collaborative uh, project. The central goal is to determine when and where fast neural activity and neural modulation happens during uh, two contracting animal behaviors in the central amygdala. These behaviors are exemplified by reward learning and also aversive learning. To achieve this goal, uh, we need to have close collaboration among the three labs. So Han Yun Zhong's lab will develop the capability to simultaneously image uh, neuron modulatory and calcium events at cellular and subcellular resolutions. Uh, Tian Yi Mao's lab will establish uh, the input output pattern of individual amygdala subregions and identify functional subdivision within the amygdala. And the Lee's lab will determine how cellular events within discrete amygdala circuits contribute to behavior 
and with integration of the progress from uh, both the drone lab and the mall lab. So finally, uh, we would like to uh, once again thank the uh, support pro provided by uh, NDIF through this Brain Initiative Grant. We also would like to thank the support from the Wallam Institute from OSHU, as well as the support from Kuzma Harbor Laboratory. I would like to thank you for your attention.